You better pray that she's alive. Good evening, everyone. This is Stone Gas Man, live from New York City. And here uh, we're going to be doing a audio commentary, a 25th anniversary audio commentary for Jonathan Mosto's, Ma Ma Mosto's Breakdown. Uh, a great film from 1997 starring Kurt Russell. I'm uh, very excited to talk to you about this movie because this is one of my favorite movies of the 1990s. As a matter of fact, I mean, I have so many stories about seeing Breakdown in the theater that I'll be sharing with all of you tonight. Uh, just to let everybody know, we are paused at the Paramount logo and we will start in approximately 90 seconds. Uh, I just want to make a couple of announcements first. Next weekend, Friday night uh, on, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. yeah, Friday night, May 6th, I will be doing two audio commentaries, one for Ghostbusters and the other for Stripes, and that will be at 9 p.m. Eastern next Friday night in tribute to Ivan Reitman, who, of course, passed away earlier in the year. So I will be doing a double audio commentary for Ghostbusters and Stripes. And then next Saturday night, as a tribute to director Peter Bogdanovich, I will be doing a double audio commentary for What's Up Doc, the 50th anniversary of What's Up Doc starring Ryan O'Neill and Barbara Streisand. And then following What's Up Doc, I'll be doing Peter Bogdanovich's debut film, Targets starring Boris Karloff. So next week, we're going to do two audio commentaries, Friday, Saturday night, both in tribute to directors that have passed away earlier in the year. I mean, we lost Peter Bogdanovich, and we also lost uh, Ivan Reitman, the director of uh, Ghostbusters and Stripes. And so really looking forward to those audio commentaries. But tonight, we're going to watch a film that, like I said, is very near and dear to my heart. I graduated the year from high school, uh, the year this came out in 1997. And th this is a film, it, it sort of spoke to me at the right time. It sort of grabbed me at the right time uh, when I was coming out of high school. And after watching Unsolved Mysteries for maybe eight, nine years, uh, Breakdown was like the perfect, like almost like a, 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 an adaptation of a real life unsolved mystery and that's why i got into it as much as i did of course i loved kurt russell before that i mean i had seen him in used cars and uh uh overboard and many other films and uh, of course that was just even better i mean to have kurt russell as the star and but also the you know this writer and director jonathan mosto who just seemed to come out of nowhere and he had been floating around Hollywood doing different things. But um, at any rate, I think we should go ahead and get started here. Uh, I, am I am paused at the beginning of the Paramount logo for Breakdown. Um, just to let everybody know, whether you're watching this on Amazon Prime or whatever, you should see the 90s Paramount logo in front of you. So, and uh, I will give timestamps uh, uh, sporadically throughout the commentary for anybody that wants to join in. But at any rate, we will uh, start at the count of three. Uh, counting down from three, two, one, and play. And as you can hear in the background, this is, of course, uh, the music score by uh, ba Basil Polidorus, who is one of my favorite, favorite compo composers. I mean, uh, look, I mean, his scores for Conan the Barbarian and Robocop are considered some of the greatest scores ever written in film. Uh, in association with Dino uh, De Laurentiis, who was, of course, the very famous Hollywood producer that was behind Conan the Barbarian and uh, the 1970s version of King Kong and many other films. Um, and he's, he's generally held, I think, to a higher respect than most other film producers just because of the fact that he uh, he gave a lot of, you know, his productions and directors leeway and freedom into what um, what they wanted to do. I mean, most famously, of course, uh, um, Dylan, uh, David Lynch on Dune. You know, he gave a lot of freedom to David Lynch to do whatever he, his mind wanted to do and everything. And uh but at the same time, he had mandates from Universal uh, for Conan 
the destroyer saying, no, it has to be PG rated because, uh, you know, we'd like to get more money, even though that makes no sense. Conan is not a PG rated character by any stretch, but, uh, and also Dune, I mean, both Dune and uh, Conan the Destroyer, they were both shot in Mexico at the uh, pretty much the exact same time in 1983. But uh, anyway, for breakdown, we're opening up here on the desert. This is in either Arizona or New Mexico. It's not really made clear. Although, judging by the license plates, I'm, uh, I'm thinking uh, there, there's Basil's uh, credit right there. I'm guessing this is New Mexico. But at any rate, this is a film that has a very weird genesis because this movie really started out as an adaptation of a Stephen King short story called Trucks. And, uh, of course, uh, some of you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, didn't, didn't they do that already? And it was called Maximum Overdrive. That is very true. Dino De Laurentiis had produced... Uh, a movie in 1986 called Maximum Overdrive, which was directed by Stephen King. However, uh, this film was originally based on another short story that is completely separate from that called Trucks. Well, when they lost Stephen King's name to advertise the movie, Jonathan Mostow, the writer and director, had to cook something up, essentially. So he thought, you know what? Okay. You know, I want to do something with trucks. I want to do something about being out there alone in the desert. And, um, you know, you're completely isolated. You know, you have that North by Northwest feeling. You know, remember when Cary Grant was being chased by the crop duster planes and everything? Um, I mean, we'll be mentioning Hitchcock many, many times throughout this commentary. Excuse me. <clears throat> But uh, he said that uh, Jonathan Mostow, the director, said that the other inspiration for this movie was the 1938 uh, Alfred Hitchcock film, The Lady Vanishes, which is a very, very famous Alfred Hitchcock production from the 30s that he made in England before he came to America to make Rebecca and he won Best Picture. And then he started, you know, making all these, you know, true American suspense classics like Rear Window and North by Northwest. So in, in essence, this movie is kind of a weird double, it's kind of a weird inspiration from both Alfred Hitchcock and uh, Stephen King. But, it, but you know, it works. <laughs> and this is one of my favorite Kurt Russell performances, you know, hands down. I mean, I, you know, look, I, I love everybody that loves like Big, Big Trouble in Little China and, you know, other Kurt Russell movies, Escape from New York. You know, his work with John Carpenter is wonderful. But um, when I saw this in the theater, I just kept on thinking, you know what? This is the type of performance where you forget who is playing the role. And that's how great uh, Kurt Russell is here. But uh, here we have um, uh, this actor who he's talking to is uh, MC Ganey who has a, a very, very distinctive look here. I'm sure you'll all remember him from another film from 1997 called Con Air. Um, yeah, Con Air. Let me just bring something up real quick. But uh, his uh, first credited performances was actually in... Uh, 1979's Time After Time, which I actually have on Blu-ray somewhere behind me, uh, directed by Nicholas Meyer, which was about H.G. Um, Wells following Jack the Ripper via a time machine up to uh, 1979 San Francisco. And he has his first credited role in that, M.C. Ganey right here, uh, in Time After Time. And after that, he did movies like Pennies from Heaven and Francis and Starman. He played a, a cop in John Carpenter's Starman, uh, Fatal Beauty, Soul Man, and Innocent, and Innocent Man. Yeah, he made a lot of man movies, essentially. Uh, the Mighty Ducks. And uh, in 1997, you know, he did, uh, in both movies, Breakdown and Con Air, he has the same uh, character name. His name is Earl. In both movies, although in Con Air, of course, he's known as Earl Swamp Thing Williams. Um, and, and Con Air is an OK movie. I mean, it's entertaining. It's it's you know, it's ridiculous, but it's it is entertaining. I just remember because he flew the plane in that movie 
And, um, you know, and he said over the, the uh, loudspeaker uh, or the microphone one time, uh, yeah, nobody on this plane gives a flying fuck. <laughs> now, that's MC Ganey for you. And uh, this is, of course, uh, Kathleen Quinlan. Uh, when Kathleen Quinlan read the script, she didn't really read the whole script. Because as fans of Breakdown uh, know all too well that she disappears practically, you know, 10 minutes into the movie. And in reality, Kathleen Quinlan just read the first 10, 10 pages of the script and said, you know what, this sounds good, I'll do this movie. She was so busy at this, at this time because when she got the offer for Breakdown, she had just been nominated for... Um, Best Supporting Actress for Apollo 13, uh, which uh, uh, Ron Howard cast her in that. Obviously, Ron Howard knew her from uh, her debut film, American Graffiti, uh, which she had starred in, the George Lu uh, classic George Lucas movie, American Graffiti. But uh, Kathleen Quinlan, I mean, I've seen her done many, many things, and I've always liked her as an actress. Uh, and I think with here, even though she has very limited screen time with Kurt Russell, I mean, you get enough of their backstory. I mean, there was originally an alternate opening sequence to this, which was kind of shoehorned in by another writer, which wanted to showcase like Kurt Russell's character out in Central America. You know, it's all on the uh, Paramount Presents uh, Blu-ray. They didn't put it on the Australian Blu-ray, but they did put it on the Paramount Presents Blu-ray, as you can see. I don't think they have it on the box, but at the same time, they put the alternate opening on the uh, Paramount version of the Blu-ray, the Paramount Blu-ray, not the uh, uh, imprint via vision uh, Blu-ray, which I also have from Australia. And I actually prefer this one just because the bonus features are a lot more uh, well done. Yeah, the bonus features on the Australian release are a bit longer and they're a bit more uh, meaty, I think, than the uh, American release. But the Paramount release also has an audio commentary for Kurt Russell and and Jonathan Mostow. And for anybody that has uh, heard Kurt Russell on his audio commentaries, he is an absolute delight. I mean, used cars, all throughout the used cars commentary, he's just, you know, he's doubled over in laughter pretty much the entire time. The entire movie, he's laughing his ass off at how hilarious everything is. But uh, we need to talk about Quinlan a little bit more because, of course, she's going to practically disappear here in a minute. But uh, she made her film debut in American Graffiti. She played Peg in that movie. And then after that, she did uh, Lifeguard with Sam Elliott, which was a big hit in 1976. Uh, she was in one of the airport movies, Airport 77, with Jack Lemmon. Uh, I Never Promised You a Rose Garden in 1977. She started out in the 70s. Um, and then she was in Twilight Zone, the movie. She was in the Joe Dante segment of, of that. And uh, she was also in The Doors. She played Patricia Keneally in The Doors. Uh, Apollo 13, of course, she played Jim Lovell's wife, um, uh, Mar Marilyn. And uh, the same year as uh, 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 Breakdown, she actually had uh, quite a few roles under her belt because, of course, she had just got the Academy Award nomination. But she had also done a, a Event Horizon, which, of course, a lot uh, that still has a lot of fans to this very day. Uh, that outer space thriller with Sam Neill, which is very nearly good. I mean, I saw it in the theater and I thought it was dazzling on a technical level, but I thought it fell short as like this, uh, you know, this Twilight Zone haunted house uh, story in space with like elements of Solaris and everything. It was weird and it was definitely creepy. And yet at the same time, I, I never felt the inclination to return to event horizon but what's interesting is that i found out very recently that another actor that it was in uh, event horizon was evidently jack noseworthy who plays the chief engineer on the spaceship lewis and clark and jack noseworthy is also in this movie as uh billy uh, and i mean we don't see him yet we'll see him a, a little bit later but 
Now we need to talk about this uh, wonderful, wonderful character actor who just uh, came on the screen here. Uh, J.T. Walsh plays um, uh, the trucker that just pulled up here. Uh, J.T. Walsh was one of our great character actors who we lost much too soon. I mean, he was 52. He was 52 years old when he passed away. And it was only a year after Breakdown came out. In fact, the writer and director of this film, Jonathan Mostel, he had J.T. Walsh for this role from the very, very beginning when he was writing this. He had J.T. Walsh on his mind the entire time. And when she, when he was eventually uh, shooting on location with uh, Kurt Russell and they were doing pre-production, Kurt Russell came to him and said, you know what, the, the guy that's going to play the trucker, you know, I, I know the perfect guy. I think I know the perfect guy for this. And and Jonathan Mosto says, well, you know what, I, uh, I, I, I know a guy who I think is perfect for this. And and so eventually, you know, Kurt Russell had to fess up and said, well, you know, you know who I have in mind? J.T. Walsh. It's like, oh, J.T. Walsh. Oh, <laughs> J.T. Walsh. I mean, that's the thing. They knew in their minds that this this guy is the ultimate character actor, that he is the, the perfect choice for this. I mean, I mean, that's the thing. John, the fact that Jonathan Mosto wrote this role specifically with J.T. Walsh in mind it just it speaks volumes as to how uh, beloved the J.T. Walsh was in Hollywood because when he passed away, Jonathan Mosto had brought had like created like this film reel of all these different parts that he had played over the years. Uh, I mean, just to name a few. I mean, his resume is unbelievable, but just to name a few, uh, he was in um, Good Morning Vietnam, uh, Tequila Sunrise. The Grifters, Misery, The Russia House, Backdraft, A Few Good Men, Hoffa, Sniper, Loaded Weapon 1, Red Rock, Rock West, uh, Needful Things, the Stephen King movie, Blue Chips, Silent Fall, uh, let's see, the uh, remake of Miracle on 34th Street, Nixon, uh, Sling Blade, the uh, Billy Bob Thornton movie. And then uh, after Breakdown, which was, he was nominated for a Saturn Award for this movie, by the way. Uh, he only made uh, three movies that came out in 1998 that all came out posthumously. Uh, and they included uh, Pleasantville, which is still my vote for the best film of 1998, even over Saving Private Ryan, believe it or not. Uh, um, J.T. Walsh also, also plays the antagonist in that movie. And also, he was also in The Negotiator with Kevin Spacey and Samuel Jackson. That was also one of his last movies. So, and many people said that after they saw this film reel of all these roles that he did over the years, they, they I mean, the general impression was like, oh my God, we completely forgot that he had done all these, all these great movies and these great roles. And it just showed how much of a chameleon he was. <laughs> Now, I mean, those who've seen Breakdown multiple times, could, I mean, they probably still have their own theories as to, well, did Earl actually do something to the, uh, to the, <laughs> did he actually get away with uh, doing something to the, to the Jeep when he was like in the service station or something? Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, when I was first uh, watching this movie in the theaters, I had those exact same questions going on in my head. Wait a minute. Was there... Was there some kind of sabotage that wasn't seen or maybe it was seen? It, maybe it was uh, on, uh, in the shot and we just uh, never saw it. I mean, the first time I saw this movie in the theater, I mean, I was just engaged from the get-go. And as I said before, there's an alternate sequence that exists out there that Jonathan Mosto insisted, no, don't use this alternate opening sequence because people were saying like, well, we need to have some kind of background about these characters. Like, no, you don't. You don't need to have any background on Kurt Russell or Kathleen Quinlan's character because, I mean, they thought they were so obsessed with character development. And they actually shot this entire opening, alternate opening sequence in 
in LA. They shot it in an LA apartment and they also shot some scenes in Central America where, you know, Kurt Russell apparently has a camera and he's, uh, you know, documenting some uh, um, war, uh, some conflicts in some other countries and everything. And he's being traumatized by the experience. You know, he's, uh, he's a photographer basically. But in, in this movie, we can never ever tell that, uh, what exactly he does. And, and, you know, ultimately we don't need to. You know, at the, Jonathan Mosto is 100% right in that when we start out, when they're just driving through the desert, you know, you know, the audience can pick up little clues and, and subtle hints of what their relationship is. It's a healthy relationship, maybe financially a little skittish, but I mean, it, 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 it sounds like they've been together for a number of years and it sounds like, you know, they've, you know, they've gotten out of scrapes before and that they're, you know, they're very dependent upon each other and ultimately that they love each other. I mean, you know, they have, you know, maybe minor issues like every, any other couple, but we don't need to, we don't need to emphasize it with another scene, which feels so out of place with the rest of the movie. I mean, the only other significant thing about that alternate sequence is that Kathleen Quinlan is practically nude. Uh, she actually gets up out of bed nude and, and goes and uh, comforts Kurt Russell in, in his uh, little uh, dark room and everything. And it just, you know, he witnesses like a, a little girl being sniped and everything. And it's just like, okay, we don't need any of this. And Jonathan Mosto even insisted when he got the budget and, and distribution from Paramount, he insisted that that opening sequence be the last thing to be shot because he was adamant and he was I'm pretty absolutely sure that he can convince the studio and, and the producers and everybody that, no, you don't need this sequence. We don't need any of this. Any of this. It, it's just unnecessary. And ultimately, he was right because, I mean, and this is a lesson, I think, for any screenwriter who's trying to break into the business. You know, stick with your gut. You know, stick with your gut. If, if you think that it's unnecessary, make it, make it clear why you think it's unnecessary. Because ultimately what happened is that they were going to do a sneak preview uh, for Breakdown, of course, you know, a couple months before the film's release in May of 1997. And, uh, and Jonathan Mostel went to them and, and insisted, okay, let's do two previews. Let's do one preview, which has the opening sequence, and let's do a second preview the second night with the without that opening sequence and which uh the second night won i mean paramount even said you know what we don't even need to look at the at the uh, cue cards we don't even need to look at the uh common cards i mean you know you're right you know we don't need this opening sequence and uh and to be honest i don't see any reason why we need to bring it up again <laughs> but uh in case you're very very curious it's it's on the uh, paramount blu-ray and this was a film that I was beginning to wonder, and I know a lot of other people were beginning to wonder, like, will this ever get a Blu-ray Blu release? Will this ever get a, a high-definition release on physical media? Because all we really had was a widescreen DVD courtesy of Paramount, which came out in 1998. And you got to remember, this was back when, when DVDs first came out. I mean, 1997 was when DVDs were essentially first released to the public. And Paramount was, um, it was released on DVD, I believe in November or December of 1997. Back then it took about six months, I should say. And I was just, you know, I saw this movie three times in the theater and I, you know, I was waiting, I was counting down the days until I can get breakdown on DVD. Because, I mean, look, I mean, in 1997, you know, I remember watching Con Air and Air Force One and uh, uh, Face Off and, you know, all these films, uh, Volcano, Dante's Peak, you know, those kind of things. And this is the one that just kind of stood out from the rest of it as just this, you know, this old school 1970s style uh, thriller, you know, in the vein of Duel, you know, the, the, the Steven Spielberg movie. I did, I did a commentary on on Duel uh, last year, which um, is available. <laughs> no, 
Now, here we have another uh, veteran of uh, movies w- who I'm sure you're all familiar with. This is uh, this is Rex Lynn. Yeah, this is Rex Lynn right here as uh, Sheriff Boyd. And uh, he was also in Sniper. I had mentioned that before. Uh, but he was also in uh, Cliffhanger. Uh, he was in Thunderheart as an FBI agent. Actually, I think most people know him from Cliffhanger because he played uh, he, he played the character of uh, Richard Travers in that. He, he was the uh, uh, the guy on the plane that had the tracking devices for all the uh, uh, for for all the uh, suitcases of money that were lost in the Rockies, and Sylvester Stallone had to basically uh, dig them all that and get rid of these terrorists who was uh, this um, this gang of thieves uh, run by. Um, Oh, what's his name? Ah, damn it. John Lithgow. And uh, Rex Lynn was on the plane, and he actually is the one that actually had all the uh, had all the tracking devices for the suitcases. So, But he knew he was going to be shot at the end of the movie once they found all the suitcases. Like, well, thanks, Travers. You, you know, you, you, your job is uh, your job is done. So we'll, we'll just knock you out right here. But he's really good in this movie, too, I think. And see, this is just all suspenseful stuff. The way that, you know, that this this great handheld shot right here where, where Mostel just makes it clear to the audience, you, look, are there any clues or is there any evidence whatsoever that she was in that truck? Because you got to remember, when, when I saw this in the theater, I had asked myself a number of times, well, wait a minute, I mean, is this the same guy? Is this not the same guy? I mean, you could, I mean, there's a subtle difference because he's wearing a different hat than he was before J.T. Walsh. But, um, you know, it's like, I mean, is there any trace of evidence whatsoever that she was in this truck? None. Not a damn thing. And as you can see behind them, they are literally in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I mean, there's probably, I mean... Jonathan Mosto was saying on the commentary track that the uh, service station that they stopped at, it's still there. And, and, you know, it's it's run by a different oil company now, but it's definitely still there. And there's literally not a town for, for like dozens of miles in either direction. I mean, this is seriously in the middle of the desert, you know. And here again, it goes back to that uh, that Hitchcock way of uh, staging these scenes. Because, I mean, North by Northwest, when Cary Grant uh, gets off the bus in the middle of nowhere to meet, uh, the, the you know, this, uh, this CIA agent uh, who supposedly exists. But after a while, you know, uh, just this, a crop duster plane just comes and... And just tries to shoot him in the middle of the, in the middle of broad daylight. Like what the hell? And that's the thing is that the idea of being just completely alone, cut off from society, cut off from the world, and there's just nothing you can do. There, there's nothing you can do whatsoever. I mean, you know. And and Jonathan Mostow, he makes the script complicated. I mean, he. The cop here is actually very, very reasonable in his assessment of the situation. You know, could Kurt Russell just be going a little nuts because his wife may have left him? And here again, we get the subtlest hints, the subtlest hints that, you know, there might have been a little bit of strain in the marriage, but not, not certainly not enough for, you know, for her to actually leave him, you know, especially in the middle of nowhere like this. I mean... <laughs> But here again, it, it adds to the mystery and it adds to the to the suspense. And Mostow, he just, you know, one thing that Kurt Russell kept on saying when he uh, took this movie because he loved the script so much was that uh, just how tight everything is. I mean, there's no there there's no unnecessary scenes. There's no added fat. You know, it just everything is just you know taken down, and it, it's really efficient filmmaking. I mean, like I said, for a first-time writer and director like Jonathan Mosto, although technically, let's be perfectly honest here, technically, this is not his first movie. Um, 
it's funny in all the bonus material while he does mention a television movie that he did uh which is not even worth mentioning uh i mean you know that's that's how he met dino de laurentis and and of course uh his uh producing partner martha uh but at the same time like okay in 1989, he actually released a movie direct-to-video called uh, Beverly Hills Body Snatchers. And so when you say that you're not doing that well in Hollywood at that point in time, that's exactly what, what you mean. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you don't want to advertise Breakdown as being from the director of Beverly Hills Body Snatchers, you know? <laughs> but no, he actually made a movie in 1989 with that title. And, and yes, it was direct to video, but uh, but he also wrote and directed it. But um, what happened was, is that when this movie was kind of in limbo for a few years, because they weren't they weren't sure because when they took when Stephen King ultimately took his name off this. You know, they weren't necessarily sure how to sell it. And, and it looks like it was gonna, it was just going to go through the cracks and melt away. Uh, Jonathan Mostel was actually originally hired to direct uh, the game, which was ultimately directed by David Fincher. Now, this guy right here, I had just mentioned uh, in Cliffhanger, uh, uh, the guy that played Travers, uh, Rex Lynn, in Cliffhanger. Well, here's a little inside joke. Uh, the guy at the desk here, he was the one that was actually flying the plane in Cliffhanger. So they were they they both work in the same police department, but they also were on the plane in Cliffhanger together. <laughs> I mean, I, I I'm sure I was probably the only one in the theater that actually noticed that connection. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> Okay, but I love this moment right here where Kurt Russell is looking at this giant bulletin board full of, um, you know, missing person posters. And, you know, the cop, you know, he goes through all these statistics about, you know, oh, yeah, all these people have disappeared. And it's not in the script, but it's kind of implied that, like, in this one area of the state, like, we have these unusual number of kidnappings or or missing persons and everything. And of course, this goes right into like, I mean, like I said, my television viewing in the 1990s was primarily made up of unsolved mysteries. Okay. Every Wednesday night on NBC at 8 p.m., I would watch the show where Robert Stack would narrate um, uh, numerous stories about UFOs and about. Uh, you know, missing persons and escaped convicts and brutal murders and uh, uh, serial killers and everything. And all too, you know, creepy as hell library music. And here again, Breakdown, it feels like an expanded story from one of those unsolved mysteries. Now, of course, this is not based on any actual uh, persons living or dead okay i mean they make that they make that very clear at the end of uh, at the end of every movie okay this movie does not have any resemblance to any people living or dead okay and in breakdown this is all fiction okay but it does feel like one of those stories that could be on unsolved mysteries every week and it, it's like yeah every week somebody else goes missing in this part of the world i mean it's pretty pretty creepy i mean it, it you know i mean like i said it's more creepy than actually finding human remains i mean just because we have no idea i mean the idea that somebody could just vanish in the thin air and everything but you know it's funny i better mention real quick is that you know if if any of you uh, guys are fans of uh, Jeepers Creepers, which is that horror movie that was directed by you know the the pedophile, well, look, the director's behavior is not what bothers me about those movies, those Jeepers Jeepers Creepers, because the truth of the matter is is that the the writer and director of those Jeepers Creepers movies actually ripped off a real life unsolved mystery that was actually shown on the Robert Stack show. And it was the, uh, uh, the, uh, the wanted segment of uh, Dennis DePew who had murdered his wife and children and had dumped them in the lot of an abandoned schoolyard. That entire first half of Jeepers Creepers 
is literally that Unsolved Mysteries segment beat for beat. Literally, beat for beat. It's it, it, it's just it's almost as if you know he took the script for that for that show for that specific segment and just made it the first half of Jeepers Creepers. So when I saw it in the theaters, I was thinking, you know what? This looks a bit too familiar. And that's when it clicked for me. It's like, oh, oh, this is the Dennis DePew story from Unsolved Mysteries. But it look, like, like I said, look, if, if you saw Jeepers Creepers in the theater and had no clue and you ended up walking out of it, you know, thinking it was a great movie and everything, hey, look, bless your heart. I mean, you know, it, Technically, it's a well-made movie, but I mean, I can't watch it again, not not necessarily here again because of the director's behavior, but the fact that he had to rip off this entire real-life unsolved mystery beat for beat that was done on the show, and better on the show, I might add. But at any rate, this is uh, actor Jack Noseworthy, uh, who plays uh, Billy right here, and <laughs> um in the beginning of the movie, I mean, you know, he's obviously pretending to be mentally challenged because uh, uh, later we find out he is uh, part of this crew and everything. And look, you know, I'm assuming that all of you have seen Breakdown before. So, yeah, you know, I mean, you should know what happens. And that's why I'm, I'm comfortable doing spoilers here, you know. But at the same time, I mean, just remember, I mean, that's sort of like the rule with commentaries is that, I mean, you, you preferably want to see the movie first, um, just as a reminder. But um, but Jack Noseworthy, I mean, as I said before, he was in uh, Event Horizon, also with Kathleen Quinlan, which um, I'm pretty sure they shot. It was either right before Breakdown or right after Breakdown. And I think it might have been right after Breakdown, but... Uh, but I honestly had forgotten that Jack Noseworthy was even in uh, Event Horizon uh, up until like a month ago. Well, don't you get it? The police are the ones in on it. <laughs> and that and that's the thing. I mean, in the theater, I mean, it's like, well, who can you trust now? I mean, it, you know, is, is it true the cops are in on it? Is this, is it, you know, who, uh, okay, now... One of the very few things about this movie that is dated, because, I mean, even though this is set in 1997, I mean, it's not too long ago. Uh, but, I mean, aside from his uh, cell phone, which is essentially a Zach Morris uh, cell phone, you know, it's this huge thing. I mean, and of course, I mean, he's going to run out of service eventually, but... Um, but what I love is that the tension is rising now. Okay, I mean things are things are bubbling up, things are steaming up because uh, you know we've had to deal with the police already. We still don't know what happened to his wife and everything. Yeah, she she just you know completely disappears and melts into the wilderness. <laughs> I mean, another movie that uh, a lot of critics cited at the time of this film's release as being very, very similar was a Danish movie called The Vanishing uh, from 1998. However, I never saw The Vanishing. I didn't see The Vanishing until years later. And, you know, actually, I do remember when my father rented the remake, which had Jeff Bridges. Uh, there was actually a remake by the exact same director. Uh, with the exact same title called The Vanishing, which had Jeff Bridges in it. And I remember him renting that, and I remember both of us being rather disappointed by it. And I'm a sucker for these types of stories. I'm a sucker for these these types of missing person, person stories and everything. They're, I mean, they're just, they're so creepy. But uh, as we see, MC Ganey is back on screen, and... Uh, Trying to catch up with Kurt Russell here. Excuse me. <laughs> and it must be emphasized that, I mean, this movie is, is full of so many insane uh, stunts and... Um, but they're all done using real cars and trucks. And Kurt Russell, 
uh, this is something to be said about his performance as well, is that he does his own stunts in this movie. Practically every single stunt in this movie, he does himself. He's like, I, yeah, I don't need a stunt, man. What are you talking about? And that's why, I mean, like I said, the scenes later where you actually see him on the truck are so hair-raising. Um, now there's actually a little ramp that you, you probably won't be able to see here that is, uh, that it's, ena it's enabling the, uh, the Jeep to actually dive into the water like that. But, uh, just to say hi to some people in the chat, we got Rob Gasper. Good, good evening. How are you doing, sir? Uh, Katrina, it's great to see you as well. Yes. And MLB fan 122. I'm glad you all can make it out tonight. Let me do a timestamp real quick. Uh, before we go any further, we are at 37 minutes, basically 10 seconds shy of the 37 minute mark right here. So go ahead and jump to the 37 mark, uh, 37 minute mark, and we'll continue here with breakdown. Hmm. But I hope you all are doing great tonight. Let me know if you're in the chat. Let me know uh, what you thought of this film. Did you see this movie in the theaters in 1997? And what you uh, what you think about this movie? Because um, I know this movie has a lot of fans. And what's amazing, I mean, this is all Kurt Russell right here. Uh, this is all Kurt Russell doing this in this very, very cold river. I mean, that's all him. That is all him, baby. I mean, like I said, I mean, he does all everything himself in this. Everything. Well, I mean, it's Snake Plissken. I mean, of course he can do all this. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because everybody has a different education when it comes to, you know, certain actors and everything. I mean... When I was growing up, the films that I remember Kurt Russell from are like Overboard and Tequila Sunrise. And, and then, of course, people would uh, other people would watch the Carpenter movies like uh, Big Trouble in Little China and The Thing. And it took me years to appreciate The Thing. And, um, and of course, Kurt Russell's performance in that it took me many, many years to appreciate it. But like I said, my, my favorite Kurt Russell film is still hands down used cars directed by robert zemeckis and written by bob gale and robert zemeckis who later did back to the future and as i said before you listen to the commentary on that blu-ray listen to that commentary with kurt russell bob gale and robert zemeckis i i swear you will be in stitches because kurt russell has such an infectious laugh and <laughs> Such an infectious laugh that it's he's such a delight to listen to all throughout that commentary. All throughout the commentary. Now, as we can see right here, is that this gang of uh, extortioners and kidnappers, they um, there's essentially four of them. Although the story would like to make you think, especially if you're watching this for the first time, the story would like to make you think, well, there could be others involved. We don't know at this point yet. Love the first half of Breakdown. Lose his steam in the second half. Oh, really? Okay. Oh. It, it worked for me the whole time, to be perfectly honest. But uh, <laughs> Jack Noseworthy. I mean, this. I saw this uh, in the theater three times, and every single time, they laughed at Jack Noseworthy right here. And, and then you realize, oh, my God. I mean, <laughs> these guys are not playing around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just talking to your wife up on the uh, space station, the Lewis and Clark, you know, in a event horizon there. <laughs> But yeah, this is a pretty nasty gang of uh, of kidnappers here. <laughs> and, and, you know, Kurt Russell, you know, he's in a legitimately vulnerable state right now. I mean, of course, he still has no idea where his wife is. I mean, he's terrified at this point, you know, dealing with these guys that he just, it's like a nightmare. He ain't no goddamn donut king. <laughs> Now, this is one of the very few things, and I mean very few things that has kind of bugged me about Breakdown, is that 
this this donut thing is such a leap. I mean, it, look, I mean, it's it's so tiny. It, it's a it's a very tiny nitpick, of course, but it's like really. I mean, just because of these donuts, you know, she had to read in the beginning, yeah, ninety thousand dollars or ninety thousand donuts, and now they think that he's this donut king, that a, <laughs> this donut millionaire. <laughs> that he has all this money from but see that's the thing i mean you know i mean it's pretty clear that that kurt russell and and kathleen quinlan while they weren't having marriage problems they were certainly having uh financial problems i mean they just bought this brand new jeep to uh to uh go cross country to move uh to california from new england and everything you know, maybe they're a little in over their head doing this transition, but you know, they're not, they're not really in the best of uh, financial health at the moment. So it's, it's, it's kind of, they're kind of super lucky that, that he thinks that, that they think that he's this donut King and that they can extort money, all this $90,000 out of him, which, you know, of course doesn't really exist. The town of Bracket, a shithole in the middle of nowhere. Yep. <laughs> And JT Walsh, man, I mean, just, just, he's so good. So good. So creepy too. I mean, just, just the way he was talking about his wife just earlier in that scene where, you know, he was uh, noting that, you know, she has the same color hair upstairs and down. It's like, it just... Like, ugh, it just sends chills through your body. I mean, I remember, I mean, when I, I saw this movie in, in the theater three times. Like I said, I saw it, for, I saw it once, uh, right after, right before I graduated from high school. And, uh, then I took my parents to see it, uh, along with some other friends. And then I, I saw it a third time with some other, other friends and, you know, the reaction was all the same. They all loved it. They all got into it. And here again, I think it, I think it helps because Kurt Russell and Kathleen Quinlan are such, um, you know, they're actors that can play, you know, everyday people. You know, they, they I mean, the audiences can identify them, of course, not just from other roles, but just just for the fact that they have this this uh, everyday every man charisma, you know, about Kurt Russell, which people people identify with. But another, I think another person who we kind of have to thank for, uh, because even though Kurt Russell liked the script and he wanted to do this movie, uh, the thing is, is that, you know, he had just finished Escape from L.A., uh, the sequel to uh, Escape to, uh, to New York for John Carpenter. And he was just, you know, he had just done like three or four movies in a row and he was just exhausted by this time. I mean, he was... And, and when he was doing this movie, because this movie, uh, this performance requires such intensity and, and requires, you know, a man being on edge the entire time looking for his wife, you know, he, I mean, Kurt Russell said he was going home, you know, with sore muscles every day because, you know, he had done, you know, other films like Big Big Trouble in Little China that required all these all these stunts and, and these big stunts. Well, he did all his stunts on this movie, but the difference here is that when he went home for the day, he was hurting so much, I mean, physically. And he also had this kind of thing, well, if Goldie is, you know, overseas making a movie, you know, I can I can do whatever I want, but when she's home, well, I want to be home with Goldie Hawn. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, you know, that makes perfect sense. So he arranged with producer Dino De Laurentiis, look, I mean, look, you know, you don't have to pay me a, a whole lot of money. Just, you know, can we arrange something where you can just like fly me back and forth to my house? Yeah, you know, every, you know, every day, and that's what they did. I mean, they, 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 uh, they sent a car to his house early every morning. They picked him up, and they put him on a plane, and, and took him out out the location wherever they were because they kept on shifting locations you know all throughout the shoot of this movie i mean they didn't know where they were going to shoot you know practically the next day i mean this place looks great this place looks great we'll go here and we'll go there but uh <laughs> and so he, and he was taken on a private plane literally every day to the set literally every day jack warden is great in used cars oh absolutely i mean used cars is 
so incredibly underrated and underseen. It's not even funny. I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, Jack Warden, you know, in that movie is is just priceless. I mean, it's and originally, you know, here's an interesting thing for you, MLB fan, is that originally Jack Warden turned him down uh, because they only offered the uh, role of of um, of uh, the villain, you know, uh, the car dealership. But when uh, but this was before they made the brothers, they made them brothers at opposite car lots. So when they went back to Jack Warden and said, well, you know, you want to play both put both roles and be brothers. He was like, yes. Because an actor, he said, he said to Robert Zemeckis, and I, and I shit you all not, that he said, look, every actor always wants to play dead. Yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> you know, that makes absolutely sense. a lot of sense. Think about it. Every actor wants to play dead. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is, this is an opportunity for me to give the greatest performance of my career. I mean. <laughs> and and oh Jack Warden in that movie he is so dead he is so dead in in used cars it's hilarious <laughs> now this was a scene in the bank here this was a scene that uh Roger Ebert cited as one of the problems with the movie like you know I've I have some colleagues that say you know as much as I love this movie that it has some uh this uh some pacing problems and this is a perfect uh example of that you know, look in the theater. I was on my on the edge of my seat the whole time. I mean, I kept on thinking the same thing: Is this guy another guy that's part of the crew? Or you know, we don't know. We still don't know at this point. <laughs> yeah, I can hear Jonathan Mostow. You know, it's like okay, now just look at Kurt. Look at Kurt. <laughs> I mean, Kurt Russell is terrific in this movie. Oh man, just just how he he's constantly looking around. He's always on edge. He's he's just always, you know, wondering what should I do next? What what's the logical thing to do? What should I what should I do? What should I do? You know, it's great. He played dead awesome. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We, I, I got to do a commentary for used cars eventually. I mean, I did one for Romance in Stone, but I got I got to do one for used cars eventually. I, I love that, I love that movie. Yeah, see, I mean, this scene right here, you know, it doesn't. I mean, I think it's I think it works just fine. I mean, I don't think it ruins the pace of the movie at any rate, but. Um... And in general, this movie actually got very good reviews from critics. I mean, I think critics were very surprised at, you know, how old-fashioned this uh, one was. And I think, you know, I mean, especially after, you know, after Kurt Russell just came off of Escape from L.A. and there were other films that time that started incorporating uh, CGI into the action sequences and everything. I mean, this movie, it just kind of stands out as just a classic you know, Hitchcockian thriller, you know, in the vein of Duel and The Vanishing. And of course, uh, another one of my favorites, which came out uh, four years after this, which was um, Joyride with Paul Walker and uh, Steve Zahn, where they play brothers and they play a prank on this trucker. And um, that's another great film in this similar vein of, this, you know, not just the truck, uh, you know, the truck connections, but you know, just the idea of being vulnerable to these, you know, psychopaths that are just on the road, you know, and everything. Hey, Jamie, how you doing? Uh, so wonderful to see you. Yes. Uh, I'm going to give another timestamp uh, real quick. Uh, we're watching Breakdown and we are at just over 50 minutes, just over 50 minutes and um, about 20 seconds here. 5020. Like I said, this movie is only 93 minutes. I mean, I just I love the brevity. I love the efficiency of this movie. Now, uh, just to let uh, everybody know, see that we used to call that a phone booth. You know, they there were these little boxes that we had to go to all throughout town to make phone. Okay, yeah. I mean, look, I mean, it's been, it's actually a little scary how long it's been since we've had phone booths. 
it's actually a little bit scary. I mean, I'm I'm actually surprised that you know we've we've had cell phones for like 20 years now. <laughs> it's like, but yeah, you look in that phone booth. You know, 20 cents to make a phone call. Yeah, yeah. You put. You, I, I remember when I was uh, uh, doing. Uh, I was taking education classes for my MA, and uh, I, you know, I read this story once that happened maybe only a couple years ago where. Um, you know, an adult in the uh, in the office of the principal or whatever in a school somewhere, you know, just gave uh, just gave a kid a couple quarters, and the kid just looked at the, uh, the quarters after his cell phone had been confiscated. It's like, what do you expect me to do with those? <laughs> yeah, you would be hard pressed to. Um, find a phone booth that, that that's left it in, anywhere in the country. That's for sure. Uh, and here we have AIM, MC Ganey driving back up. This, this scene is so tense. Oh man. It's like, and, and Kurt Russell's face, it really says it all right here. My mother was a massive Kurt Russell fan, and I don't think she was prepared of the uh, the amount of violence in this movie. I mean, she liked the movie as much as my father did, but I it, it gets a little it gets it gets a little rough here for for the next uh, few segments. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. What other choices has he had? I mean, he could yeah, just shoot him out there in the middle of nowhere. Uh, very subtle acting on the part of MC Ganey. I mean, he just, you know, he, you know, he looks real quick, like, is it okay? Is it okay? I mean, I mean is the right amount in there? I mean, it doesn't look all right. <laughs> Uh, bounds his hands with duct tape and just drags him into the truck. Oh, man. But, and also, the, the three times that I saw this in the theater in May and June of 1997, the audience reactions were very, very similar in all three in that you know, everybody was on board. I mean, there was this tension. There was this, you know, this un, almost unbearable amount of tension all the way through the movie until uh, at the climax when that tension is finally released and, and people actually breathe for the first time after like an hour. But like I said, I mean, you, you know, you have a rock solid script, very efficient, very tight by Jonathan Mostow, and you have this wonderful selection of character actors like MC Ganey and Rex Lynn and uh, and Kathleen Quinlan and JT Walsh and Jack Noseworthy, and they all contribute so much to this. And of course, you know, on the commentary, Jonathan Mostow makes it makes it clear that you know, hey, you know, MC Ganey, you know, he plays these 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 horrible guys and like this and con air but no sweetest guy in the world of course he is of course he's the sweetest guy in the world i mean i'm sure i'm sure he's a delight <laughs> yeah you just want to go to concerts with him right i mean <laughs> come on Well, no, so he has a Texas license plate, but it's supposed to be either Arizona or New Mexico. I mean, I guess it ultimately doesn't matter, but, you know, somewhere in the south, uh, the southwest. But, um, oh, and here he, he, here he realizes, oh, wait a minute, there's only $100 bills on the outside. It's like, oh! <laughs> Now, I'm not sure how many people actually caught that in the theater when he took the letter opener. And he also took the uh, the uh, the uh, the cash slips that have the uh, the amounts on on them and everything. I mean, um, like I said, very quick deck death shot of him taking those things. But I, I'm sure there were some audiences that didn't even catch them. 
Oh! <laughs> and and this idea right here, I mean, like credit to Jonathan Mosto for bring, uh, thinking of this brilliant idea on how to tape this guy down. It's just... It's like... <laughs> I mean, Russell is getting, you know, he's getting more outraged. He, he's just, he's, you know, he's beginning to lose it. And he's go, just going to go off on him. But, I mean, he just, you know, tapes his entire neck down to the car seat. I mean, that is just genius right there. Hope you don't get whiplash. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh man! I mean, it looks like it hurts. Okay. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> you want me to stop? You really want me to stop? Because <laughs> I bet this baby stops on a fucking dime. <laughs> great, just great. Yeah, that truck has obviously seen its fair share of mud and dirt and everything. <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> oh boy, Rex Lynn. He's <laughs> uh oh, this guy who just lost his uh, who uh, lost his wife. He's on the rampage. <laughs> so... He was obviously coming back after that uh, fake, uh, you know, a traffic stop or report or accident on the I ninety or whatever that he that he was being forced to go out there to check out and realized, oh, there's nothing out there. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I mean, uh, here again, anybody in the chat, I mean, um, what what do you guys think of this movie? Seriously. I mean, um, tell me some of your favorite Kurt Russell movies, too. <laughs> now, if I remember correctly, the director of photography on this movie was uh, Douglas Milsom. That's right. Uh, he was the um, he was a camera operator on a bunch of Stanley Kubrick movies like uh, Clockwork Orange and Barry Lyndon and The Shining. He, he you know he also worked on that. And he became a director uh, a collaborator with director director Stanley Kubrick following John Alcott's death in 1986. And his filmography includes numerous genre films, including Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Highlander Endgame, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and Dracula 3 Legacy. And he has also worked with Jean-Claude Van Damme on films such as Legionnaire and The Hard Cops. Hmm. Very sadly, his son, Mark, uh, Mark Milsom, he was also a camera uh, operator, but he was uh, sadly killed uh, several years ago during a shoot. And at the at, at the inquest, the coroner ruled it as an accidental death. Oh, that's a very sad. Oh. But yeah, Douglas Milsom, he, uh, uh, his first movie was actually Full Metal Jacket for Stanley Kubrick. Um, then he did Lonesome Dove and If Looks Could Kill, Robin Hood, uh, Body of Evidence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Last of the Mohicans, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, I wanted to talk about something during this segment of the movie. Because, uh, I mean, there's some awesome stunt work that, that you'll see coming up here where uh, Kurt Russell's on the truck and everything. But I have to say, one of the reasons why I think I found this story so compelling and also so uh, scary is the fact that, of course, when I was watching Unsolved Mysteries, one of the most chilling stories that I ever saw on that show, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure which season it is, 
But evidently there was um, in 1990, so probably season three, season four, there was uh, a segment about a serial killer in Ohio that would pick up prostitutes at uh, truck stops and would knock them unconscious or kill them at the stop and then put them inside uh, the, the trailer for a month and keep the body uh, frozen for an entire month in the, in the, in the, in the, in the back of his truck and would literally dump the bodies on the side of the road uh, all throughout these different jur jurisdictions in Ohio. And that's, that's key to remember right there is that they were all completely different jurisdictions. Uh, and that's why there was a lot of uh, speculation that the the killer was actually a former police officer or a former security guard who knows enough about police investigation to have dumped the bodies in these in these different juris jurisdictions just on the side of the highway. Now, aside from the fact that it's just so devastating because most of these victims were never identified. And of course, you know, there's that stigma, the, the prostitution stigma and everything where, I mean, they actually had a shot of one of the uh, victim's uh, graves and all it said on there was somebody's mother, somebody's daughter. That's all it said. I mean, it's, it, it's devastating and it's scary. But yeah, apparently they never caught him. I mean, the only clues they ever had for this Ohio serial killer was that he used the um, the CB handles uh, Dr. No, Stargazer, and Dragon. I like this little kid right here. <laughs> it's like he doesn't even notice. Doesn't even notice. But yeah, ch check out that check out that segment on Unsolved Mysteries, the Ohio uh, serial killer. Like I said, I think he had like at least ten victims, and they never caught the guy. Sadly, they never caught him. Or, or I mean, if they did, I mean, they they were hoping that he would be you know in prison already, rotting somewhere for for some other crime. But no, apparently they never identified who the killer was. But they knew he was the same guy, clearly because of the pattern and just how, and, that, and that's another thing too, is that what makes it all the more sickening is the fact that these bodies were, you know, they were mutilated. I mean, you know, the, the you know, their heads were bashed in and they were just, you know, they were just, the remains, I mean, it just, it, it just felt like so, somebody had just punched the life out of them which is just, oh, God. I mean, it, it, I shudder just thinking about that. I'm surprised they haven't made a horror movie about this guy yet, seriously. It certainly would be a lot more scarier than Jeepers Creepers, huh? <laughs> yeah, like I said, I, I'll say it one more time. I mean, you know, Unsolved Mysteries was responsible, you know, when they showcased the Dennis DePew story, that's exactly what the guy from Jeepers Creepers drew upon to do his story. And like I said, the first half of the movie, literally the same story beat for beat. How they shot it on Unsolved Mysteries. This is really hair-raising stuff. I mean, like I said, this is all Kurt. Kurt did all his own stunts in this movie. And you got to remember, he's in his early 40s doing all this. Pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, the suspense with the mirror and everything. Oh, it's awesome. It's awesome. Like I said, a weird combination of inspiration right here. I mean, a Stephen King short story called Trucks and the Alfred Hitchcock movie The Lady Vanishes from 1938. A very, very, very unique bits of inspiration here for what I, what I think is a, a truly underrated action film from the 90s. Now, I, I, we're about to enter a little dangerous area here because we find out that this guy who's been running this uh, extortion and murder ring 
actually has a family. He he actually has a wife and a son. And of course that that raises even more questions like well they do they know what what he's been up to? I mean, do they know about uh him and his crew and what they get away with uh for, for and I like here again, nothing is spelled out for the audience. I mean, you know, Jonathan Mosto just puts clues in. I mean, as we'll see right here when uh, Kurt Russell comes out of hiding and everything and he goes into the barn and we see all these license plates strewn all over the um, all over the uh, floor and everything It's like, oh, these guys have been around and they've had, you know, God knows how many victims at this point. Uh, you know. Here again, like that, like that trucker in Ohio, you, you know, I mean, we will, we'll never know. We'll never truly know how many victims there were, but at least in this movie, we'll have the comfort knowing that somebody is going to put an end to, to what they've been doing, you know, for, for God knows how long Kurt Russell is going to stop them. See that license plate says New Mexico. I'm pretty certain that this is New Mexico. But then again, it also suggests that they were driving all night. So I guess they could have started out in Texas and ended up in New Mexico. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter. They're in the American Southwest in the middle of nowhere. That's that's really all that matters for this. In the theater, like I said, at this point, you couldn't hear a pin drop. Nobody was breathing at this point. Nobody was breathing. <laughs> this movie reminds me of race with the devil ah i have to double check what that movie is oh really oh this is interesting uh race with the devil that movie it's directed by jack starrett and most people know who Jack Starrett is because he played Galt in uh, First Blood. He's actually the, the guy in the uh, helicopter that tries to uh, kill Sylvester Stallone and he, and he falls out and dies. I will be doing a commentary for a Jack Starrett movie here in just a few weeks uh, for, a, for a movie he directed called... Um, well, now... Uh, oh, man... What is the name of it again? Well, I will be doing a Jack Starrett movie later this year. I mean, I just uh, can't remember the name of it right now. But yeah, he was a director back in the day. And he he did that movie, Race with the Devil, which, to be perfectly honest, I've never seen before. But it looks interesting. Action horror film directed by Jack Starrett, written by Wes Bishop and Lee Frost, with Peter Fonda, Warren Oates, Loretta Swit, and Laura Parker. Oh. oh, yeah, this is it. Uh, the Jack Starrett movie I was talking about is The Strange Vengeance of Rosalie, which stars uh, Bonnie Bedelio, who is... Um, better known as uh, John McClane's wife in the first two Die Hard movies, and as well as Ken Howard, who played Thomas Jefferson in 1776. So yeah, I'll be doing that in mid-June. I'll be doing that movie in, in uh, mid-June, The Strange Vengeance of Rosalie, directed by uh, Jack Starrett. Uh, I, I like this sequence because, like I said, it's all told from Kurt Russell's point of view. And, oh, no. I, there, there were actually some gasps in the theater at this point, you know, thinking, oh, my God, did she actually die? <laughs> Must have died from the exhaust. Oh, God. 
And that's the thing. I mean, you could tell that, you know, every time they've done this, it's like some survive, some don't survive. And, and, and the ones that su do survive, I mean, God knows what they go through, you know, after, you know, after they come back to the barn here. Oh, oh. Yeah, see how they're laughing and playing around and everything. I mean, this is, they, they've done this dozens of times, dozens of times. Now, this bit right here is also a bit of a stretch if you really think about it. That Okay, you can tell from that shot right there, it would be almost impossible to actually tell that there's a, uh, a human eye, you know, that you could actually see the eye through the floorboard at that distance and at that angle. I mean, she shouldn't be able to see him right here, but, you know, let it go. You know, it's all right. Ugh. So, yeah, they're going to put her in an old fridge in this uh, hole in the barn. Ugh. And lock it up and go have some breakfast. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, these guys... <laughs> And all the while you're thinking, okay, I mean, just you just want Kurt Russell to bash their heads in with that uh, Louisville smuggler. <laughs> you just just want to jump down there and bash them all, bash them in. But here again, I mean, with the script and with Kurt Russell's performance, I mean, you could tell that, you know, his character has never been in this type of situation before. You know, he's never... And that's an, yet another reason why the director kept on arguing that the opening, the alternate opening sequence was just completely unnecessary. We don't need to see him, you know, dealing with his job and dealing with trauma at his job and everything. Ultimately, what he does is... Uh, you know, what he does for a living doesn't matter at all. I mean, what matters is that he needs to get his wife back. And luckily, he was able to find a gun in that glove compartment. <laughs> And since he can't get the lock open, he realizes, well, the only the only thing I can do now is uh, confront them. And that's exactly what he's going to do. Now, uh, the son, who is probably about 10 or 11 at this point, I mean, we get a, we get a very quick peek of him in his bedroom playing. Um, it's either the original Doom or Doom 2. I'm willing to guess it's Doom 2. And uh, interestingly enough, I remember uh, at the same time in 1997, uh, a month before I had seen in the theater a gross point blank, the uh, John Cusack action comedy where... Um, uh, he plays a hitman going back to his high school reunion. And in that movie, he actually blows up a uh, convenience store that used to be where his mother's house was. And during the ent entire time he's shooting at this uh, assassin in this convenience store, the uh, the clerk is actually just on his headphones playing Doom 2 in the corner. You know, <laughs> and you, you see all this uh, shit flying around behind him and everything. <laughs> it's great. Now, this is a great scene because if you notice, for breakfast, they're all drinking Budweiser beer. <laughs> Even the wife is drinking, having a beer. <laughs> but of course, we have to let Kurt Russell take control of the scene here. Damn right.
very audible reaction in the theater to that. Oh, fuck. Like, you had no idea that the sun was going to come up behind you with a gun. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Not, not to give the guy credit, but yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, hey, you know, you're only to use this gun uh, in case m mom is ever in trouble. But, you know, it's like when he first drove up and he gives the gives the kid a Swiss Army knife. Like, oh, yeah, great parenting right there, man. <laughs> Just great parenting. I mean, don't get me wrong. If you're a Boy Scout and you, you know you're learning learning survival skills, fine. But it's it's almost like he's preparing his son for whoever is going to come by. You know, whether it's the police or whoever to just go to war or something. <laughs> Jack Noseworthy, of course, gets away there. <laughs> Now we don't really get any kind of story about the other guy. I mean, there's a there's an older guy that that looks like he's a veteran based on uh, like the hat he wears, and I think in the car that he drives later, there's like a bumper sticker or something that actually suggests that he's like this messed up maybe Vietnam vet or something that just kind of just like found himself with this crew that's gonna. You know, go around and extort and kidnap and kill people, but uh, we don't really, uh, we don't really get his story. Not, not to say it matters at this point, because oh god, <laughs> see, th this is right out of unsolved mysteries. Th this is something that you could easily see in a in a reenactment on that show, and it and it rings just as true. I mean, these may not be real people, but they look and sound and feel like real people, like real human beings. And it just adds to the drama and the tension. And they're finally reunited. And he, he basically says the, the same thing I would have, which is, no, you now you get your ass down there. You get the fuck down there. <laughs> See how you like it. <laughs> now, e every time, all three times I saw it in the theater, when Kurt Russell kicks J.T. Walsh in the face and he falls down, instant applause. Instant applause. I mean, you're talking... Like, like, finally, I mean, like, finally, you know, just, you know, bash the guy's face in. You, you just want him to do that so badly, and he finally does it. And I love this bit right here where Billy uh, grabs the, the guns, I mean, with, with Basil's music, I mean, just powering up here in the last, uh, in the last uh, stretch of the movie. There were actually there was actually an alternate music score that I listened to some of on the Blu-ray because there's actually an interview with uh, an assistant of Basil's on the um, Australian Blu-ray release. Okay, I have seen Breakdown probably at least a hundred times, and the thing is, is that as you know, the script is so tight. And, and everything falls into place and works so well. And yet there is a mistake. There is a mistake that I caught in these, in these last few minutes that I'm sure other people have, have called the movie out on it before. But as you can see in their hands, they have two guns. They have the gun that he got from the glove compartment. And they also got the gun that uh, they got from Zeke uh, in the kitchen earlier. Just keep that in mind. Just keep that in mind. And like I said, I mean, these are all real cars and trucks that were all used for these stunts uh here and out on the highway 
It's like, oh man. <laughs> Now, I should mention before the movie uh, does end, uh, like I said, there's two Blu-ray releases for Breakdown that you can choose from. The uh, Region 1 Paramount uh, Edition, which is this right here, uh, both, uh, both this and the Australian release came out uh, within six months of each other. The... American version, the Paramount Presents American version for Region 1. The featurettes on this are not great, but we do have an interview with Kathleen Quinlan, and we do have an interview with Jonathan Russ, uh, Mostow, as well as a commentary with Jonathan Mostow and Kurt Russell. And we also have an interview with Martha De Laurentiis, uh, who is, of course, uh, Dino's assistant and who served as a producer on this movie. Uh, she has some interesting things to say, I got to admit. Uh, and, and we also see the alternate opening with a alternate commentary with Jonathan Mostow. And it, this is a solid release, but at the same time, I actually prefer the Region 2 release from uh, Via Vision Entertainment and Imprint. Because I think the bonus features on this are a lot, lot better. 1080p high definition uh, presentation from a 4K scan by Paramount. Audio commentary by film critic uh, Peter Tonget. Uh, the okay, I gotta re read this. The trap is set inside the stunts. An interview with stunt coordinator M. J James Arnett, who talks a lot about this sequence in particular. Yeah, this is all amazing, amazing stunt work. Uh, it's going to cost you making breakdown an in-depth interview with writer-director Jonathan Mostow, which is different than the interview on the Paramount release, by the way. They're two completely different interviews. Wrong Place, Wrong Time, Remembering Basil Polidorus, an interview with musician Eric Colvin on working with composer uh, Basil Polidorus in 2020. And uh, They Think I'm a Dummy, which is an audio interview with Jack Noseworthy on Breakdown, which is actually one of my favorite uh, features on this, as well as Life is Jeep, Breakdown, and the Psychology of the Road, a visual essay by Ian Man Mant Mantgani, and finally an interview with film critic Tim Roby. Yeah, I think the bonus features on this edition are just much, much superior. Uh, if you are a true Breakdown fan, I would recommend you get this uh, copy as well as the Region uh, A copy. Uh, make sure you get this before it sells out because usually with these imprint via Vision releases, they usually uh, sell out too soon. Oh, man. Uh, oh, oh, oh no. Like I said, every single time I saw this in the theater, the audience was so on board and they were so, you know, in the on the edge of their seats the whole time and especially during this climax where, you know, just people were going nuts at what was going on on screen here. I mean, you know, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to kill him once and for all. <laughs> it's like, Oh. And this, of course, is the shot that they utilized for all the trailers Paramount did, which showcased uh, uh, Kurt Russell dangling from a, from a truck over the side of a bridge. That shot right there. That's great. So we're not over yet. We're not we're not done yet. <laughs> All the other guys are dead. It's just JT Walsh. And you, you need to have this in this in these kind of movies. You need to have the final showdown. Um, I remember when I was watching Cliffhanger with my father, and despite being the fact that he was not a Stallone fan at all, he actually actually thoroughly enjoyed Cliffhanger uh, as much as I did. Uh, but the only thing is, is that at the end, when Sylvester Stallone um, 
you know, when he falls and he actually falls on, on top of the helicopter uh, instead of falling down into the ravine, that was the one point where my father said, oh, come on. You know, it's like, OK, <laughs> but the point is you you had his attention all the way through to the very end. And for a Stallone movie, that's that's uh, quite a quite an accomplishment. <laughs> Yeah, I love this final showdown on the truck here. <laughs> Damn. Ow. <laughs> and, and, you know, it ends within a split second. Fast and quick. Now, pretty much 99.9% .9 of anybody could not survive that fall. Uh, you know, you're falling on rocks, you know. <laughs> Another complaint that Roger Ebert had about this movie was with the ending. But, you know, how else are you supposed to end this movie? In that, I mean, we don't, I mean, what, I mean... The audience is out of breath. I mean, we we don't need another like with the old alternate opening sequence. We don't need an alternate closing sequence either, which shows them you know you know comfortable back in California and they just survived all this. I mean, so many movies actually do that. It's like okay, no, why not leave you know leave the audience hanging at the most breathless moment, which is just them in the middle of the nowhere. You know, they they survived. They survive this ordeal, which is all that matters. You know, how they get out and what they eventually do, it doesn't really matter. I mean, the point is they survived. That's all that really matters. We don't need anything additional. But, you know, one thing I'm glad they interviewed, I'm so glad that they interviewed Kathleen Quinlan for the uh, Paramount Blu-ray release because... Um, she actually confessed uh, on that in, in that interview that Kurt Russell basically gave her this final moment, which was to let her um, pull the gear on the truck and uh, let the truck uh, fall on his body. <laughs> that right there. Kurt Russell gave her that because... And to me, it makes perfect sense. I mean, she's the one that, you know, that, you know, suffered throughout this whole thing. I mean, of course she wants to get back at this guy. <laughs> so I love, I love the fact that Kurt Russell gave her, you know, that final, that final bit. And we basically close, we basically close, you know, them exhausted. They're in the middle of the street. They're probably dehydrated. You know, hopefully they'll they'll make it to civilization to get something to drink at the very least, because who knows how long they haven't had water at this point. But, uh, you know, just a, a, a great, you know, camera goes back, goes back. We see them on the bridge. And then just fade out. I love that ending. I love that ending. And just to say real quick while the end credits are going on is that Jonathan Mostow, you know, this is such an impressive debut. It's such a stunning debut from a writing and directing standpoint that he never really matched it. And, you know, he the movie he made after this was a submarine thriller called U571, which got a lot of complaints uh, for the fact it was so... Uh, Americanized, and it didn't really give the UK credit for what they did during World War II regarding the the German U-boats, uh, U-boats, and stealing uh, uh, codes and everything like that. But I still very much like U five seven one, and I went to see it only because I'm a huge Breakdown fan. <clears throat> but after after U five seven one, Jonathan Mostow would then direct. Um, basically director for hire. He did Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines, which a lot of Terminator fans are not a fan of, and I have to admit that I wasn't a, a huge fan of it myself. And I never saw his uh, last theatrical release, which was the Bruce Willis thriller Surrogates, 
Uh, I never bothered with that, but, um, and unfortunately, I mean, his last few movies have gone back to direct the video. So he, he never really achieved the kind of success that he did with his first film breakdown, because this was a modest hit in theaters and in Hollywood, it's actually considered a, a beloved thriller. I mean, you'd be surprised. Um, I got from the interviews on both of these Blu-ray editions that, that people in Hollywood look at this movie as a model for other directors and other writers to follow. Uh, and it makes perfect sense. I mean, it's got a great classic Hollywood star. You know, it's got a airtight script. And it works beautifully as a kidnapping thriller. It really does. Sensational stunt work. You know, great performances all around. Uh, the late J.T. Walsh, who, of course, uh, passed away much too soon and, uh, uh, you know, still left behind an incredible resume full of uh, character actor uh, character acting and, and performance and everything. I mean, this is a great film. For J.T. Walsh to go out on. It really is. But here again, I mean, you know, in, in 1998, he also made Pleasantville and um, The Negotiator, which were also very, very good. Jonathan Mostel actually got credit for lyrics on one of the songs here. But yeah, that is Kurt Russell in Breakdown. Uh, I want to thank everybody for for coming out tonight uh please uh, be sure to smash that like button if you haven't yet and like i said next week next week next friday night uh may um six yeah friday may 6th uh i will be doing a double audio commentary for ivan reitman uh ghostbusters and stripes uh as as uh, you know, Ivan Reitman, of course, unfortunately passed away earlier in the year. And I want to do a double commentary for both Ghostbusters and Stripes. That'll be next Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And then next Saturday on May 7th, I will be doing a double audio commentary for Peter Bogdanovich, the late Peter Bogdanovich for his films, What's Up Doc, starring uh, Ryan O'Neill and Barbara Streisand as well as Targets, his very first film starring Boris Karloff. So that will be all next week. I'm going to be doing four commentaries over the course of two months. And so it's going to be really, really awesome. I'm, I'm going to make the announcement on Twitter right now. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming out, out, out uh, tonight. I really appreciate it. Final shout out to everybody in the chat. Katrina, Rob Gasper, MLB fan 122. Uh, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. And I uh, hope you all enjoyed Breakdown as much as I do. And uh, uh, excuse me, we'll see you next week. Thank you very much.